Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us today uh, for this webinar. My name is Courtney Razor, Director of Member Services and Communications here at the California Fresh Fruit Association. Uh, CFFA is proud to partner with uh, Greenspan Public Adjusters to bring you this information on how operations can best be prepared um, in the event of disaster. Joining us today, we have our expert panelists, Steve Severade and Grant Staking. Steve has over 30 years of experience representing both uh, residential and commercial clients and has been with Greenspan since 1992. Grant joined Greenspan four years ago and holds a public adjusting licenses in four different states. And he has a strong knowledge of insurance on both the retail and wholesale sides. So thank you both for your uh, participation today and bringing this information. Um, for anybody um, attending the webinar, if you have any questions, please uh, use the question and answer box and we will uh, try to go get to any specific questions throughout the presentation. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Grant and Steve. So thank you. Thanks, Courtney. Thank you. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today with CFFA. We really value uh, the membership um, and uh, we, we know a lot of the members. They are, some of them are our clients. Um, just a little bit about Greenspan, the Greenspan Company Adjusters International. We've been uh, settling and negotiating large insurance claims for the policyholder for 75 years. Uh, this is actually our 75th anniversary We've been involved in every major wildfire and every high profile uh, large loss, whether it be fire, wind, hail, or water. Uh, we're here to act as advocates for the policy holders um, and uh, provide education and resources uh, to, to those who are, are going through a large claim. Great, thanks Grant. So we're gonna talk a little bit today. We're not gonna to take too much time because sometimes these webinars can get a little long in the tooth, uh, but we're gonna cover coinsurance, which is often misunderstood. And it's an important concept as you're going through your risk planning for your business. Uh, we're gonna talk, talk to you a little bit about how to protect your employees. If you uh, have a loss and you're suffering a business interruption claim and what that looks like to protect your employees and keep them uh, in your employ with the insurance insurance company helping to fund that. Then we're going to talk about what full coverage looks like. Uh, and oftentimes people are busy insuring buildings and things and they're missing out on a lot of ancillary items that have become you know, really valuable and important. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what the valuation is of crops, either uh, on the vine or post-harvest and, and through production. So first of all, coinsurance. Coinsurance was like many things, started for all the right reasons and then grew into something that you know, really isn't for the right reason. So it started off, it's, it's essentially a penalty clause, but it didn't start off that way. It started off many years ago, somebody would have a factory and they have a 100,000 square foot factory and there'd be a dividing wall in the middle of it. And a smart business guy would say, well, I'm never gonna lose this whole factory to a fire. So I've got a dividing wall. So I've got a 100,000 foot building. I'll just insure 50,000 because I'll never lose more than 50,000 square feet. And that become very, became very unfair, Grant, to the insurance companies because the insurance companies had a risk of a 100,000 square foot facility, but they were only collecting premium for 50,000 square foot facility. So when somebody would have a fire or something would happen, uh, the insurance companies weren't, weren't properly getting uh, their premiums for that to make sense. So they came up with this idea a long time ago, and it was a fair idea at the time. And they said, listen, if you're going to not insure properly, if you're going to only insure half your building and expect to be covered, well, you're going to have to participate if you ever have a loss. So you're going to be a co-insurer should any loss ever occur. So that makes sense. Fast forward many years later, this co-insurance clause still exists, but people aren't going out trying to underinsure their buildings. They don't understand co-insurance and oftentimes their agents, and Grant, you're an agent, you know. Yeah. Uh, sometimes their agents don't really even understand or grasp the concept. And it means different things in different places, like a lot of insurance terminologies look funky because in health insurance, coinsurance means something completely different than it does in our world of property insurance. So essentially, uh, what, they're, what you're saying when you have a coinsurance clause in your policy, and I would ask all of you to check your policy and find out if you do, uh, it's either 100%, 90%, or 80% typically uh, of value. So what you're saying is, 
you're going to ensure 100% the value. And if you don't, they have the opportunity to Monday morning quarterback and uh, essentially pay you less than your full loss or damage. So to give you an example, because it's a little bit complicated, the math is what you did carry in insurance over what you should have carried for insurance times whatever your loss is equals your payment. So in our examples on the screen here, if you have a 100% co-insurance clause and you carried a million dollars worth of insurance on your property and they do an assessment after you have a fire or some other insured event, and they say, well, you only had a million and we've now looked at it now after you've suffered a loss and we think you should have bought 2 million. So therefore we're gonna have you participate as a co-insurer, a participating insurance, uh, self-insurance sort of fund uh, times whatever that is. So in this example, if you did carry a hundred a million dollars and you should carry two million dollars, and you had let's say a two hundred thousand dollar loss, then you carried one half of what you should have, and therefore your payment would be one half of your loss. In this case, it'd be a hundred thousand. So you would bear the responsibility for a hundred thousand dollars of your loss. And I can tell you that doing this thirty two years, Grant's been doing it for a while, and a broker before. Our clients never know when we meet them, we go, hey, did you know you have this clause and you're kind of be underinsured? Nobody ever expects this. Nobody ever knows about this. And this, as you can see in my example, can be a, a big hit if you're not prepared for it. So the most important thing you can take away from this little webinar that we're doing is check to see if you have co-insurance. And, and I, I would also add, um, you know, we'll take a quick look at the second example. If you have a million dollars worth of insurance and you had 80% co-insurance, that means insured to value you're at 1.6. It comes out to a million divided by 1.6 is 0.625. You multiply that by your $200,000 loss, um, you are not going to recover $200,000. So you're leaving roughly about 40% on the table. And I think Steve and I, we've, we've seen this far too often with all the wildfires that have happened, even if they're not specifically in the valley, what's happening up north in Napa, um, up in the Redding area, uh, the Shaver Lake area, all of those things contribute to a demand surge. So if you've had a policy for a while and there's a three or 4% inflation guard, and you just think every year it renews a little bit more, you have a little bit more insurance. What happens though is historically when there's a demand surge is roughly what, 34%? That doesn't keep up with it. So your policy right now, you could be underinsured by anywhere from 20 to 40%. Raw materials, uh, COVID has uh, increased the cost of construction by about 15%. So let's say you have co-insurance, it's 80% and you have a million. Check your policy, check with your broker. Uh, the cost of construction, as many of you know, has skyrocketed um, within the past year, but certainly uh, since the 2017 fires in Sonoma, that seems to have kicked it off. Um, you, you may be 20 to 30% under and you haven't really paid attention because you thought the inflation guard protected you. Uh, let's do a policy review with your broker and make sure you're, you're insured to value. Because again, if the cost of construction is 30% higher than it was last year and you have that co-insurance clause, uh, if you do have a loss, you may get a penalty. Or if you've added equipment or if you've added onto a building, all these things sometimes don't get uh, filtered down through the broker. And as you can see in these examples, if you do have a co-insurance clause, 100% co-insurance clause is the one with the least wiggle room because you have to insure every dollar to value. And that's why we did the second example, because if you have 80%, it gives you 20% of wiggle room that maybe I was off a little bit and it gives you that opportunity to have a little wiggle room. The best thing you can do if you have a co-insurance clause, though, is ask your broker to add what's called an agreed value endorsement. And it's not expensive, right? But if you add this agreed value endorsement prior to having a loss, uh, that waives this whole mathematical equation. You no longer have to worry about it. But I will tell you that co-insurance and having a co-insurance clause is a very normal part of commercial insurance policies and ag policies as well. So this is something that if you don't know about it, most people don't. Uh, you should get out your policy, take a look, talk to your broker. Uh, and with co-insurance, the one thing you can't change is how much insurance you bought. So once you've suffered a loss, you can't change that, that number. You can negotiate about what you should have carried. That becomes a very negotiable argument. And you can negotiate about how much your loss should be. 
but you can't change the number of how much you bought. So again, really important. And that's why we spent quite a bit of time on it. Uh, so protecting your employees during a business interruption. So if you have an event and it closes you down, the insurance policies, almost all the insurance policies will, will insure your employees for us at least a certain amount of time, 60 or 90 days, uh, where you don't have to lay off any employees and they can continue to be paid. So even if it's going to take you longer than that to get back in business, what a lot of businesses do, and Grant, you and I have seen this many times, they, they panic because they've suffered a major loss and they go and they let go of almost all their employees. And all they've done is the employees don't have a job, they're not getting paid, and they've just saved the insurance company money, but they haven't done anything that helps them, helps their claim, or helps their employees. So before you panic and go and let go of a lot of people, the first thing you ought to do is take a look at the policy and find out whether you have uh, coverage for ordinary payroll, or if you don't. But even if you don't have coverage for ordinary payroll, typically for the first couple of months, you can keep all these people online and not panic. And by panicking, all you do is save the insurance company money. But by taking a, a more staged approach and really reviewing the policy and understanding the terms, you might be able to hang on to a lot of those people, at least for a while. Yeah. And ha having that ordinary payroll, typically, right, Steve, it's 30, 60, 90 days, it gives the policy holder time to come up with a strategy on um, how to move forward, how to best engage the insurance company in the event of a loss. Sure. And also some policies don't have that exclusion and don't have the 30, 60 or 90 day rule, in which case you don't have to let go of your employees at all. So that's the first thing one find out is, do I have 60 days for all of my employees or do I have unlimited? But even if you have a limited amount of time where you can pay all of your employees and get reimbursed by your insurance company, the next step to that is key employees. And key employees are a negotiable item as well, right? Because they will say, oh, well, the CFO is a key employee. Well, everybody agrees with that. But we've had claims like, like in restaurants, for example, where the bus boy has been there 20 or 25 years, knows all the customers, knows everybody. He's a replaceable job as a dishwasher but we've successfully argued that that dishwasher is part of the glue uh, fabric that keeps that restaurant together and keeps all the regulars. And we have argued specifically for this, that he might just be a busboy or even a dishwasher, uh, but he is critical to the success. So the way you decide who you don't need to let go and continue to get the insurance company to fund is if we were to reopen our business tomorrow, would we be losing something by not having this person? And if it's just somebody easily replaceable, well, those people are probably going to have to get let go, or you're going to have to make a business decision just to keep them, uh, but not be paid back. But you can make an argument that a lot of people are key employees to your business. Yeah. So yeah, even even um, for you know people working in in, in the field, uh, let's say during harvest, and you have the uh, in carriers, insurance companies typically look at hourly rate employees as non-key employees. I I mean that's pretty consistent. Again, we're able to negotiate that. Um, but if you have somebody who works in the fields that is hourly rate, the insurance company will say he's not a key employee. What if that's the, the individual who can speak English and translate to everybody? He's essential uh, to, to all the other workers. So you wanna keep him on payroll. So a lot of it is narrative. Um, you as the business owner, the policy holder, uh, should be able to dictate what your business looks like going forward in the event of a a, a large uh, disaster or event, it, it shouldn't be up to solely the insurance company um, to decide who's a key employee uh, and, and who is not. So having the proper disaster uh, recovery team in place to understand and strategize on how to go about moving forward in the right direction uh, it is critical because again, it's your business, you're in charge. Um, the carrier shouldn't be the one dictating you Who's, who's a key employee and who's not. So we also wanted to talk a little bit about uh, when you're going through your policy and you're going through renewals or you're talking to your broker, uh, we see often that a lot of things, people get the buildings, they get the big stuff, they get the, the farm equipments listed. The <laughs> uh, they're, they're, people are pretty good about that. But where we see a lot of people, especially what we've seen these, these wildfires lately, uh, is the trellises, the sprinkler systems, the lines that are running through the fields. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes there'll be some 
nominal amount of coverage that's thrown into the ag policy that covers you for trellises and these kinds of things, uh, it's usually not enough. Fencing is another good example. When we get into these ag losses, uh, we've had we've had losses where there's two miles, four miles of fencing, and it wasn't even co contemplated. And there's some fencing coverage for fifty thousand dollars, and it doesn't you know it's not even close. Doesn't even come close. So when you're looking at your coverages, start looking at your infrastructure, start looking at your tanks, your trellises, your irrigation lines, uh, all these kinds of things and, and contemplate the more specifically you can ensure these things, the less argument there will be at the time of loss. So, you know, you could have coverages for, for, for uh, fencing, but we've had an argument from the other side saying, well, the fencing is only this kind of fencing for this kind of, what about the deer fencing? What about the perimeter fencing. And so the more specifically you can write your insurance coverage so that you protect what you know is valuable for your operation, you're going to do a lot better in the event of loss, right, Grant? Yeah, especially in, in ag. Uh, insuring something from a 10 or 15,000 foot level uh, is, is a mistake, as Steve said. Um, the more specific you can get, um, the better. So Harvest and beyond. So, so I think all of you recognize that crop insurance is, is what is the is not the greatest solution, but really the only, mostly the only solution to stuff when it's on the vine or on the tree or the bush. Uh, but when it comes off, how do we value it? And it depends on the policy, right? Uh, but oftentimes when you take something off the vine and it goes into a processing area, it then becomes part of your stock. Uh, and then the question is, is it, is it covered as uh, going out and buying uh, new stuff or it's work in progress? How much of the work in progress is covered? Is it, is it covered at selling price? That's any discounts? Can we expand on that a little bit, Grant? Yeah, there, there's certain. So let, let's take uh, almonds, for example. Almonds um, or almonds? Uh, I, I say almonds, almonds. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, after, after harvest, um, you know, it can go to the hauler, the, the sheller of facility, and it goes through the roller to get all the debris out. Um, that's an incurred cost. There's a different value um, that is associated with that. Um, then um, it can go to uh, processing for sizing. It can be stored. There's a different cost associated with that, that as well. Um, so it's really important that uh, documentation is key in a, in a claim. You want to be a specific, where were we at in the process from our facility, our farm to someone's table? Where were you in that process? There's a different cost association, a cost associated with that. Um, so it's really important to document that, um, and, and have a plan on how to do that. Because when you submit that to the insurance company, uh, they may have a different number in mind. So it's really important. So it's another good conversation with your broker to ask your broker, how am I insured for my stock when I take it off the tree or off the vine or off the bush and it goes into the facility? Am I insured at selling price uh, what I would have sold those almonds or almonds for uh, bagged and done minus my savings because I didn't have to go through the processing and all that kind of stuff. So that's one way to get to what your value of stuff and process. You take the selling price, let's any discounts and any unincurred things, uh, as Grant's pointed out. Or the other way is, do I take the raw material and add the value going up through processing? Yeah. So there's kind of two ways to get there. So it's it's helpful if you know sort of how you're insured uh, through the stages. And, and I, I'd add one thing uh, that af after the Zoom, when you talk to your broker, ask if you have a selling price endorsement specifically. So a selling price endorsement can keep your sales channel open. So let's say uh, some of your product goes to Trader Joe's, Safeway, Whole Foods. There's a price point, everything for everything. Uh, what you sell something to somebody else may be different. Um, and you can keep that. So that, that allows you to have that uh, uh, specific price in mind. In theory, the insurance company would then, then honor that. So I definitely look and see uh, the, um, the selling price endorsement that that'll be, that'll be critical. Same thing for your international supply chains. Um, you want to definitely, definitely look at that. Yeah. And these recent wildfires, we are handling a lot of wineries, obviously. And, and in some of those claims, 
they were able to re-blend some of the wines or blend it differently or buy some grapes and mix it with some grapes that had been in process that were in tanks exposed to smoke. And, and, and so in some of our claims, they were able to use some of these sort of damaged grapes and still make something out of them. So they retained some of the value. So they didn't get paid all from the insurance company, but it helped their business. And then some of them, we just got rid of altogether. And the ones who had selling price endorsements, they were basically the insurance company became their customer and <laughs> bought all their wine. And in some of the cases, it was wine that was sitting in tanks. It was wine that hadn't even been processed yet. It was wine in various stages of aging or bottled. Uh, and all of those products got paid as if they were finished goods to the customer, less any discounts or other production costs. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways it can happen. And, and we've seen it happen many ways just in these you know, last few years of wildfires. So we've talked about co-insurance. Uh, we've talked about protecting your employees during business interruption, not just running to lay off people, but taking a strategic look and looking for the future. Sometimes that includes finding temporary places and finding other ways to utilize people so they can stay on and you don't lose your staff. As we know, staffing has become very difficult lately. Uh, all businesses are suffering. So you hate to let go of good employees, even if they're not key employees, you hate to let go of them these days because it's so hard to find anybody. Yeah. So uh, makes everybody more of a key employee. Yeah, it's true. It's that, that, that's if an argument we might want to make. Yeah, if, if you're working now, it, they're a key employee in my, in my mind. So that's something we, uh, we would look at. And we've talked about valuation of your product after harvest. Uh, and uh, again, trying to keep this in a reasonable amount of time, we're going to sort of wrap it up unless anybody has any questions. Grant, do you have anything you want to add? No, I, I think if we, if we have some questions, that would be, that would be great. We look forward to your events when they're back in person and getting to know all of you and and having exciting, titillating conversations about insurance coverages. Everybody's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a dry subject, we know, but it's really important. It's really valuable. And the time to learn it and understand it is before you have a problem and a need, not after. So with that, Courtney, we'll turn it back to you and unless there's any questions.